rubber guns, and 14 six-pounder guns and an assortment of smaller arms. In 1917, 5-inch 51s replaced their old 5 and 8-inch guns. Her total complement was 33 officers and 395 enlisted men. Well folks, time to sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode on the USS Olympia. Just minutes before midnight on the morning of May 1st, 1898, American Commodore George Dewey's fleet slipped quietly into the calm waters of Manila Bay. Just a week earlier, the United States Congress had declared war on Spain, which had ruled the Philippine Islands for 300 years. Dewey had prepared well. Intelligence from local spies had been collected, and his crews were well drilled and ready. Most important of all, Dewey commanded an imposing fleet from a powerful new cruiser. She was the Olympia, the flagship of the Pacific Squadron and the pride of the still young American Navy. The Olympia's bold entrance into Manila Bay marked an important turning point for the cruiser. No longer just a lone commerce raider preying on enemy trade ships, she was now an integrated member of an attack force poised to lead her nation into war. The groundwork for this new role for the cruiser had been laid several years prior in the writings of an American naval officer named Alfred Thayer Mahan. While Mahan had served in the North's blockade fleet during the Civil War and commanded ships in both the Atlantic and Pacific, he had never fought in battle. But he did suggest the formation of the Naval War College and later served as its president. Alfred Thayer Mahan was the father of modern American naval thought. Uh, he taught at the Naval War College from its beginning in the 1880s, and by 1890 was beginning to collate his lectures and put them in book form and come forth with the most famous book, Influence of Sea Power Upon History which basically said, if a nation is going to be great, it has to be a sea power. Mahan theorized that wars were won by nations that commanded the sea, and that such control could be secured, not by disrupting trade, but by destroying an enemy's fleet. Only large fleets of powerful warships, acting in concert on vast, watery battlefields, would have the ability to achieve these victories. Mahan's theories prompted naval leaders throughout the world to look at their existing fleets in a new light. In the United States, it raised the level of debate between those who advocated traditional scouting and raiding functions for cruisers and those who were anxious to throw them into the set-piece battles described by Mahan. The advocates of Mahan's theories won the battle of ideas, and only eight years after Mahan published his famous book, the Olympia was leading a squadron of four cruisers and two gunboats on a mission to crush the Spanish fleet anchored in Manila Bay. The sturdy but elegant vessel was well suited to the task. Weighing 5,870 tons and packing four 8-inch guns mounted in twin turrets, the Olympia was protected by armor plates two to five inches thick, which were believed to be strong enough to withstand enemy fire from guns her own size but light enough to allow swift and decisive movement at sea. And the Olympia was fast. Originally conceived for commerce raiding, her two powerful steam engines could move her at a speed of 21.7 knots. The Spanish defenses at Manila were formidable, at least on paper, consisting of seven warships backed up by 37 gun emplacements on shore. Confident of the abilities of the eight-inch guns and protective armor of his cruisers, Dewey steamed smoothly into the bay. Forty minutes later, as the American squadron came within range of the still-anchored Spanish ships, he issued his famous order to the Olympia's captain, You may fire when you are ready, Gridley. Captain Charles Gridley was ready. Since graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy, he had waited 34 years to command a major ship in battle. Though dying of cancer, he had refused to be relieved, and now he gave the order for the Olympia's guns to open fire. Though they were shooting at stationary targets, the results were less than ideal. 
of the 4,000 rounds fired by the Navy at the time, only 2% hit. And it pointed out the need for improved gunnery and eventually culminated in the uh, creation of a centralized fire control system for warships. Nevertheless, before the morning was over, the old ships of the Spanish Pacific Fleet were all either sunk or smoldering. And Dewey calmly ordered that breakfast be served to his men. The Battle of Manila Bay was over. Not a single American ship had been lost. The only casualty was Captain Charles Gridley, who died of his cancer before he could be sent home to the United States. The Battle of Manila Bay was the decisive, indeed the only, naval battle of the Spanish-American War in the Pacific. It was also a watershed for the cruiser, which in the course of one eventful morning had helped to transform the United States into a world naval power. The cruiser's success at Manila Bay secured a place for it in the world's main battle fleets as military leaders planned for what they believed would be the great naval clashes of the 20th century. The Olympia was decommissioned for the first time in November 1899. She was recommissioned in 1902 to serve as the flagship of the Caribbean Division. Over the next few years, she spent her time patrolling both the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. In 1906, she became a training ship, and she would remain in this role for a number of years. Between 1912 and 1916, she was a barrack ship in Charleston, South Carolina. However, in late 1916, she was recommissioned into the fleet in preparation for the American entry into World War I. Her service in World War I was a bit short. The U.S. declared war on Germany in April of 1917. The Olympia spent her time escorting convoys and patrolling the U.S. East Coast. However, on June the 15th, 1917, a mere two months or so later, she ran aground and spent the next eight months in a repair dock. Her next operation was carrying an expeditionary force to Russia to act as peacekeepers as Russia was undergoing a communist revolution. After World War I, the Olympia continued to fly the flag and conduct goodwill visits at various Mediterranean ports. She also conducted aid missions such as bringing refugees who had fled the war back to the Balkans. While she continued to serve for a few more years, one of her final missions was quite memorable. On October the 25th, 1921, the USS Olympia was responsible for bringing back the body of the unknown soldier from France. Here we see the Olympia as she is today. This is her aft 8-inch guns. Now some of you might be wondering, well didn't the 8-inch guns get removed and get swapped for 5-inch 51s? And that actually did happen, but when the Olympia was made a museum ship, she had her original configuration restored. Next to the Olympia at this museum is the USS Bakuna, which is a World War II Balao class submarine. Now, as we walk from the stern of the ship towards the bow, we just pass to our right one of the ship's 14 six-pounder guns. And now, one of the really strange things is when I think about a six-pounder gun, they're not very big, and I really didn't see the point of them actually putting it on a ship, to be honest. Potentially, this is the reason why later on we didn't see uh, these tiny little caliber guns anymore. As we continue our little trip from the stern of the ship to the bow, we pass by two of the Olympia's funnels. These are actually quite distinguishing features for this particular ship, and it makes her a bit easier to identify when you're looking at her in the photos. Now, one of the things I've noticed is at least when you look at the top, you know, the upper deck of the ship, she does seem to look like she is in a reasonably good state. And you don't see a lot of rust, you don't see a lot of problems. You know, most of the things are relatively well painted and stuff. However, when I show you some of the video from down below decks, you should see that this ship is actually in desperate need of repairs. And they're sort of just making do with what they've got so far. Anyways, this is the original ship's bell from 1893 when the ship was being built. And this bell is located pretty much near the first funnel and right behind essentially where the bridge deck is. Now, the bridge deck compared to a lot of more modern battleships or actually warships is really, really small and quite comparatively being quite open and not very armored in, in this case. So take a look here, um, right to the left here. This is the actual bridge of the ship with the wheel, the compass, you know, the speed selectors, and there's like a table there, I guess, for maps to, you know, figure out where to go and one chair. So 
not the most amazing, I guess, bridge that you know most of us have seen compared to you know, let's say other ships. But you know, I guess it got the job done, and that was okay. So here we are looking down the length of the ship. The Olympia is not a very big ship. She's only 344 feet long, or 104 meters, compared to the nearly 270 meters or 887 feet for an Iowa-class battleship. Here we're now looking at her forward 8-inch guns, and this brings us to the end of our little tour. Now we're going to go below decks. This area here is called the Officer Saloon, which is basically an area reserved for the Olympia's senior officers. Now these rooms that you see here were basically the living quarters for these officers. Now compared to what the ratings got, the officers lived in awesome conditions. Now the seating area in the middle here actually hides an ammunition hoist which brought up shells for the rear 8 inch guns from the magazine below. Now I really really like warship designers for this, they are always able to find space to do things with and, and I'm always impressed by that. Anyways, the floor of this area that you're walking on is actually the original Douglas fir deck which was freshly varnished in 2002, so essentially walking on a piece of history as well. And we're moving on. This is the officer's wardroom. Olympia's senior officers would gather in this wardroom for meals and conversation. Now, the captain, however, did not eat in this luxurious room. He had his own personal stateroom on the deck above. Next up, we have the general crew area. As you can tell in the Olympia, the crew slept in hammocks. Quite a huge difference from the cabins of today's warships. Interestingly enough, though, there is another one of the ship's six-pounder guns. Now. They seem to be placed in very interesting places. I wonder how they handled and dealt with ammunition safety and things like this. The Olympia was also the first ship in the US Navy to be equipped with a mechanically chilled drinking water dispenser, also known as a scuttlebutt. The Olympia was also equipped with her own printing press so she could print out official documents and also the shipboard newspaper, The Bounding Billow. She also had a well-equipped surgical room, as you can see here. This is one of the Olympia's 5-inch casement mounted guns. To fire these guns during combat, the porthole looking plates would be unbolted and lowered so the gun would have the ability to traverse. The 5-inch guns were aimed what can only be described as an iron sight. These were pretty ineffective and led to really low hit rates during combat. But onto the saddest topic of all, the Olympia is currently in really really poor shape. Her hull is rusting, and there are holes at the waterline that are clearly visible in certain areas of the ship. Take for example the aft torpedo room, where you can see the damage is quite obvious. In other areas of the ship though, she's had temporary repairs that has covered up a lot of the real problems that exist underneath it. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that if you just happen to have a chance and you're in Philadelphia and you've got a little bit of free time, go and visit this ship before she is lost forever to the ravages of time. And that's all folks for this episode on the USS Olympia. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I leave you all with a clip from the Library of Congress of the USS Olympia in our glory days. Take care and I'll see you all on the high sea soon.